Okay, again, welcome back everyone. Uh, this is part two of a three part series on NO2 uh, observations from space. Uh, in part one, uh, on last Tuesday, uh, Melanie McCulloch, she covered data from OMI and some of the introduction to the OMI sensors and how to get the data of OMI and TROP OMI on NASA Earth, Observer, Earth Data Science um, website. So uh, again, my name is Pawan Gupta. I'm a research scientist here at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and I will be making today's presentation. So as, as you can see, the webinar agenda, session one, we already covered using the OMI data. Session two, in today's session, I'm going to introduce the TROP OMI, which is a new sensors and its data product specifically focusing on NO2 observations. And on the week or the Monday, next Monday, which is session three or part three, we will take this data uh, from OMI and TROP OMI and use uh, some Python scripts to display, extract uh, and map the data uh, and that Part three will be two hour long session on Monday. Uh, for that, uh, we will do some preparation today as well uh, in terms of getting the data and making sure everybody has Python installed on their system and it's working. So I'll show you uh, some of those preparation towards the end of the, uh, uh, the session, um, but let's start with uh, session two or part two of this series. So in today's session, we are mostly going to focus on TROP OMI, which stands for Tropospheric Monitoring Instrument. Um, we will try to learn about TROP OMI data products. Uh, we will go uh, and access some of the TROP OMI data uh, through various online tool. Uh, Melanie has shown some of the data access already uh, during the part one of the series. And we will also use a tool called Panoply to display drop on data. So the learning objective uh, or the expectation uh, after completing this session, we expect that people will be familiar with the drop on satellite and its capability in global air quality monitoring. Uh, you should be able to download the drop on data and also able to display and map uh, some of the drop on data products. So just taking you back in the past and some his, historical aspect of uh, uh, ozone and other uh, tropospheric uh, trace gases measurements uh, from space. Uh, so this specific slide basically uh, gives an overview of, of the space missions uh, mainly operated by uh, European Space Agency and they goes back from 1995 when the GOM, uh, which stands for uh, Global Ozone Monitoring Experiment, and there have been multiple series of the GOM instruments since it was first launched in 1995. GOM was one of the first uh, UV measurements, uh, which makes measurement in ultraviolet part of solar spectrum and mainly used to extract the information about tropospheric trace gases come uh, tropospheric and stratospheric trace gases. Then Skiomaki uh, OMI is currently operating and it's uh, one of the instrument which we looked in the part one of this series. And you can see there are GOM 2A, GOM 2B. And then uh, coming 2017, the TROP OMI was launched on Sentinel P5P uh, platform. Uh, and then there are following GOM 2C, Sentinel 4, and Sentinel 5, uh, some of those missions, uh, including uh, GEMS and TEMPO, which are geostationary missions to uh, perform similar tasks, uh, but with very high temporal resolution, and they will be focused more on a regional scale. And uh, Melanie introduced that, some of those in the part one, uh, where Sentinel-4 will cover the European and African continent. GEMS will be launched by the Korean Space Agency and it will be covered 
It will cover a good part of Asia, including Australia. Tempo will be launched by NASA in here in the US, and that will cover North America. So there is a lot uh, of space sensor already up, and there are several in plan to make a tropospheric and a stratospheric or atmospheric composition in general uh, for various applications, including air quality and climate. With that, tropospheric monitoring instrument uh, is aboard uh, Sentinel-5P precursors. It stands for S5P. So there will be separate Sentinel-5 uh, launch uh, later in the time, but this is a precursor. It's again low earth orbiting uh, atmospheric chemistry mission, just like Aura, which has award OMI instrument, which we talked uh, last Tuesday. It was launched by European Space Agency uh, last October. Uh, the good thing about the TROP OMI that it make measurements in uh, multiple part of solar spectrum, UV, visible, near IR, shortwave IR, and it's basically a spectrometer. The typical pixel size at the nadir position is about 7.7 .7 into 3.5 square kilometer for all the spectral band, with the exception of that UV1 band and shortwave IR band has a little bit coarser resolution in one of the direction of the SWAT. So we will learn about more about those uh, as we go along this presentation. Uh, here are some more information about the TROP OMI. Uh, the SWAT is about 2,600 kilometers, which is about the same as OMI. Uh, repeat cycle is 16 days. It's uh, in the similar orbit as Aura satellite, about 800 kilometers above the Earth. Uh, so it takes about 16 days to make measurement of the same, uh, same exact same position to the Earth. Uh, but the, in terms of the global coverage, uh, it provides uh, daily global coverage, and we'll see some global pictures coming out from the TROPOMI in a, uh, as we move along this presentation. The local solar time. Uh, this is the overpass time at the equator which is 1.30 p.m. Uh, so during the daytime, around local solar time, 1.30 p.m., the satellite overpass to the equators. This time can uh, differ at different places, uh, but typically uh, if you calculate the local solar time, then it's about 1.30. You must have heard in previous presentation the typical lifetime of these space sensors uh, designed earlier are uh, used to be, for example, Terra, Aqua, or Aura, they were designed to work for three to five years uh, with the advancement in the technology and more uh, confidence in the uh, space mission. Uh, these lifetimes have been increasing. So this specific mission is designed for seven years. So uh, we assume that this will last 15, 20 years at least uh, and will provide useful measurement of, of about atmospheric composition. Another good thing about the TROPOMI that it makes measurement within the five minute of NASA SUMI NPP satellite, which has multiple uh, sensors, including arms and bears, which provide very useful information about clouds, aerosols. So these synergy of these two instruments, bears, arms, and uh, TROPOMI, will we really help us to provide better trace gas product because viewers can provide very high resolution cloud information and that feedback to drop OMI algorithms in terms of cloud clearing the scene and that helps actually improve the accuracies of trace gases which we retrieve for the atmosphere from the drop OMI measurement. The spectral coverage. Uh, the spectral coverage is uh, very uh, unique uh, from the TROPOMI. Uh, as we have seen in OMI operates around uh, 270 to 500 nanometers. So it mostly operates in UV and some visible part of solar spectrum. So the if you look this table, the first row 27849, that's basically where the OMI was operating mostly. So it has additional channel from OMI. TROPOMI has 710 to 7 
75, which is specifically used to get um, height information of aerosol layers and clouds. And then you also have uh, another channel, uh, which is IR near IR channel 2.3, uh, 2.3 to 2.2 in the range of uh, 23 uh, nanometers. Uh, and that specific bands uh, with very high spectral resolution of 0.25 nanometer uh, has been specifically going to be used to retrieve information of methane and carbon monoxide. Uh, so the different spectral channels have been are going to be used in the retrieval algorithm to extract uh, different component of uh, Earth atmosphere. So mostly the first part of the solar spectrum uh, from UV to visual, they are used for ozone, uh, SO2, formaldehyde, and the NO2, which we are going to talk a little bit more. So in terms of number of channels, you can compare with the MODIS. Uh, people who are familiar with the MODIS sensor, it has only 36 channels. As compared to here, you can see there are more than 2,000 channels in this specific sensor. Advancement. So we will always be going to compare uh, how the tropomy is advancing as compared to its previous sensors, including GOM, OMI, Skamaki, and others. So better spatial resolution, it's almost six times higher than OMI. So if you compare the OMI's uh, footprint on the surface in terms of the uh, area and square kilometer, then its uh, tropomy is about six times higher spatial resolution. The signal to noise ratio is another very critical component of any space, uh, space sensors and that determines how good the data you will receive or retrieve, what will be your accuracy and precision. And the signal to noise ratio is very high in case of trauma OMI compared to OMI. Since it has additional band, so they provide uh, and it can be sent, uh, it, it make measurement within five minutes of years. It provide additional information on cloud, which was unavailable, which was limited actually in case of OMI. So the cloud clearing, uh, cloud masking algorithms are better for tropomi and they provide additional uh, improvement in accuracy when we retrieve uh, tropospheric compose uh, or the atmospheric compose compositions from tropomy. Uh, we will have in uh, from OMI to tropomy, we will have carbon monoxide and methane measurements and they, these data sets are already available and we'll see them uh, some example today. The data rates is very high also compared to uh, OMI. Okay, so what I'm going to do is there are several uh, tools or online uh, resources uh, to extract the information or to get the information about the TROP OMI, its data, quality, a lot of documentation. Uh, and European Space Agency has specifically put together a lot of efforts in providing all those information to the public or the, to the end users. So I'm going to just browse through some of the website and show you some of the places or specific capabilities uh, you can get through this website. So this is the first one. It's called Science Website. Uh, and if you click on the link, I will take five minutes to browse this website for you. Uh, let me make sure you can see my screen. So I'm going to switch to the, uh, I hope you can see my screen now, you know, which I'm showing a website called observing our future. So this is a science website. You can see on the right, uh, bottom right side, and you will find a lot of details on this website. So if you kind of move up and down, you will start seeing some of these uh, little icons start appearing. And basically they are different product which will come out from this specific sensor. So you have ozone, ozone profiles, which will give you the vertical information nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, formaldehyde, cloud, methane, aerosols, and other products. Now, if you go on the top tab, it says mission status. So people who wants to learn about the mission, they can find details here. So the, the first line, it says it has been launched in October 2017, that time and all the details. 
And if you go on the right side, um, every page of this website actually has this documentation. And this is really important. So you can see on the right side, uh, Mission Performance Center, port, different portals, uh, different uh, ways in which you can access the data and some of the tools and some additional links. So just in your own time, uh, try to browse this website. If you click on the data product, you will uh, reach to this page. And on the left side, you will see there are level one, level two, ancillary validation, data access, mission performance. So I'm just going to click on level two, just very quickly to show you. So you can see the list of all the data product which are here. And there's a table here, which I'll go in a little bit in details in a few minutes. Again, on the right side, you can see the link of important documentation, ATBT, which is algorithm theoretical basis document. So anyone who is interested in learning how exactly NO2 or any other product is retrieved from the fundamental measurements of radiance in those spectral band, they must refer to this document called algorithm theoretical basis document. It has all the details, all the nomenclatures, uh, algorithms, and everything you should be pointing. Then there's uh, PUM, which is basically uh, product user manual. So it will give you details about the products and the files. Readme is a file about uh, data product file, and you will see all the names of SDS, which will go through uh, some detail. But this is really, really important resource for any users who like to use the TROPOMI data, uh, no matter which product you are using. Uh, users should be familiar with all these uh, documents and they should look for information if they don't find in these documents. There are more. Uh, under more, you can see there are tools, documentation, public gallery, uh, features, results. Uh, we'll show some of their exciting results, and I'll show you a few of those here in today's. And in about, if you find information and not able to find under the website or you have trouble, there's a contact me form and you can message them and I hope they will respond to you. Okay, so this is one of the website uh, which uh, is really useful. Uh, anyone who like to use the TROPOMI data, I strongly suggest you bookmark this and go off on here whenever you point time. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, it's called uh, uh, again, you can actually go to this webs the next slide directly from here also. If you click on the mission status and click on go down and there is a mission instrument and data status and called a calendar. And if you click on the calendar, then you will see a lot of data here. Okay, uh, not many users uh, really need all this information, but this is for people who are um, really interested in learning engineering and monitoring and various things. So I want to show very quickly one of the tool from this website called Orbit. When you click on the Orbit, what it will do is basically come up with a map and it will show the current position of TROP OMIS uh, currently. So you can see a green and red line, and the TROP OMI is moving here, right? It's currently over uh, Alaska, and it's moving down, and the shaded area, the darker area, is basically a region of Earth where currently it's nighttime. So it's right now, it's passing from the daytime to nighttime, actually, TROP OMI. And you can see orbit details here on the right top corner um, where it says date, latitude, longitude, speed, and all the details. So this is interesting just to see where the uh, TROP OMI is currently making measurements. So then you can go to Earth view. On the Earth view, you will find a those who have used uh, uh, NASA's world view tool. This is something like that. It's not exactly 
uh, world view, but something like that for tropomy only. And here, uh, remember, uh, what you see here is kind of a false color RGB on this map right now. And then there is a daily RGB also. If you click on the daily RGB true color. So one thing, uh, anyone who has taken introductory of satellite remote sensing are familiar with the image processing. Uh, they know that RGB or the true color images are made up of three bands, red, green, and blue. And while we were discussing earlier, the tropomy has, does not have red band, but it has kind of a green band, which is not exactly 550 nanometer, but about 500 nanometer, and then it has blue band. So it is, this is not exactly uh, true color or RGB image, but uh, modified version of that. And that is why you see it's, uh, it's not very uh, as good looking or as uh, clear showing features as you will see on the, the MODIS or VIRS data. But you can see uh, things here uh, and you can zoom specific areas. You can change. There are other, uh, uh, other options to see the images. Uh, there is a minimum reflectance, which you can see. Um, so this, this, there's a lot of tools. There's a quick look. Uh, here you can actually see some of the data products uh, quickly uh, and some of the fundamental data sets and how things are changing. People who are interested in monitoring the performance of the instrument in terms of the calibration or other things, they can go to this uh, link called trends and this trend will show you some of the uh, trends relative to the some particular on the x axis you have this orbit number so it's basically showing on the y axis how the performance of in a specific channel is changing with respect to the first orbit I believe or the certain number of orbit they have chose and if you look Although it looks like it going down, but if you look the number on the y-axis, this is a fractional change. So it's really within two, three percent um, things are changing. And if there is anything abnormal happens, uh, there is a calibration team which makes sure that those adjustments are made uh, in the data set so that uh, uh, the level two data sets are unaffected by these calibrations uh, adjustments. Okay, so I'm going back to my presentation now and uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so you are able to see my presentation now. I'm going to, so this we already looked. This is the current Earth view. This is a website very similar uh, to what you have seen uh, in, in part one where Melanie has shown you how to download the data from the Earth data uh, from the NASA. This is similar uh, website called EO browser. Uh, here you can actually browse a specific data sets. So just let me quickly go through this website uh, this will require registration to use uh, certain features. So if you have not registered, you can click this link and register. Uh, but I'm going to click here on the top link and that will should take you to the Sentinel Hub uh, website. And I'll show that to you. Okay, so now you should be able to see uh, my web page and on the most of the web page shows the map and on the left you have some panels on the right you have some panels which should be very familiar if you are using the, uh, any of the world view or any of the similar tools okay so i'm going to go and focus on the united states for this specific uh, view uh, on the right there are several options which i'll show you in a minute but on the left, if you see this panel, the uh, top, top left panel, then you will see there are various satellites here, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, 
the one which we are looking is called sentinel 5p because that's where the drop omi is aboard and once i click the sentinel 5p then you see the name of data product start appearing so aer ai which is aerosol index then you have methane cloud carbon monoxide formaldehyde no2 ozone and so2 so let me click first one which is aerosol index and then i can choose the date range from here so i'm going to just pick a date in let's say august 2018 uh, i'll pick 24 and then again i'll go to august 2018 august 24 to 25 I just chose one day range to search the data and what I'm searching for aerosol index uh, you can select any of the data if there is NO2 also if you like to see that and then I'll say search so since I have zoomed into my area to United States it will show the orbits which have on those two dates on this location and now I can see all the orbits which actually covered that area and then there's a button called visualize so I will say visualize and then what I see is there are two aerosol index product one is like Tom's those who are familiar with aerosols this is a 340 to 380 nanometer uh, which is close to what Tom's used to provide and then there is a 354 to 388 this is close to what OMI, this is exactly actually same as OMI's aerosol index. So now you can start seeing the aerosol index uh, over this location. I'm going to pick the one with the OMI equivalence. Uh, and if you click this arrow on the, then you will see scale, which goes from minus one to five. Aerosol index values can vary actually from minus 10 to minus 10 to uh, plus 10 um, and I can zoom specific areas uh, I can change the date from the left so I can go one day back August 24 this is August 24 and the image will change in a minute and you will see this huge plume of aerosols coming out of the fires during the that time in US and Canada and with the weather system it's actually transporting over Atlantic and over the Europe so you will see a really nice plume once it's loaded completely here in this uh, image just give give it little time so if you are browsing with me um, this is a really great tool to see uh, almost near real time data uh, and visualize them uh, on this and you can use this share this again on the right side there are many many different options you can select a specific area you can go to the specific point and then click on that plot thing so this is specific feature is not available uh, let's see if you click on this bottom panel which is kind of animation it will animate all the images which we have searched and you can play those animation by clicking here you can also download so you can see how the aerosols are moving with the weather system and you see this lines these are basically orbital line uh, in while satellite is making measurements so you'll see some discontinuity but uh, you should be able to see uh, how things are moving from one day to another day so this is really nice okay uh, now let me get back to the presentations again uh, spend some time as part of your homework I strongly recommend you browse this site get familiar with yourself from this website and if you plan to use Sentinel 5p or drop on me data this is really good resource for you to be to use so I'm going to back to my presentation. Okay, so I hope you are able to see the slides now. 
Okay, let's move on. Uh, so this is the table which I showed you from the on the website, but these are all the product. And if you look the last column of this uh, table, then you see it says released or uh, give some date. So for example, aerosol layer height. This product has not been yet released. It will release sometime this year. Uh, ozone profile, which will provide actually the vertical information about ozone. This is also going to be released sometime later this year. But otherwise, most other products have been released. Uh, we are going to focus on nitrogen oxide uh, in today uh, exercise and in the uh, on Monday while we start doing the uh, Python script. So this specific webinar is focused on NO2. But same, all those same information can be applied for all of the products. And feel free to use anyone which make, uh, which you are using in your own research analysis or applications. So this is just an example. This is the same image which I just showed you on the Sentinel Hub, just created using a different tool. It's uh, UV aerosol index, again, August 24, 2018. Uh, those red colors actually shows the aerosols uh, coming out from the fires in terms of the smoke particles and traveling long distance with the weather system. Uh, on the right side, you see an example of uh, aerosol layer optical depth, which is tau on the left panel, and the right panel is uh, height of the aerosol layers. This is just right now showing just an example. This data product has not been yet released, but once it is released, you will be able to get the height of aerosol layers in the atmosphere. And this specific product uh, is really very useful for people who are doing modeling of air quality. If you are a modeler, then one of the parameter which goes into the model is called injection height or the height layer height and those uh, can be very critical in actually uh, providing accurate uh, air quality forecast. So uh, look, the, uh, specifically modeling community is looking forward to have this product from the top only. Methane, this is again showing some example of those product which we just saw the list. Methane, uh, this is a global map from May 2018 to January 2000. 19, so it's about eight months uh, global mean, and this is a mixing ratio of methane all around the world. And you can see uh, how uh, the resolution is very high in different parts of the world where the methane is uh, there in the atmosphere. On the right, you can see the SO2. Again, uh, it is average for uh, several months. And you can identify actually different specific uh, uh, source location using the SO2 data and by looking these data sets for long term as Melanie has been showing some example how the OMI SO2 data has been used to see the trends in SO2 uh, uh, SO2 amount in the atmospheres over the last several 10 to 12 years and TROP OMI is going to further enhance our capability to identify those specific sources uh, just because it has really high spatial resolution compared to OMI uh, and the accuracies are also expected to be better. The NO2 data, which is focus of this webinar, uh, there are three different types of the data sets you will see. Uh, one is called near real time. Uh, whenever satellite is launched and the algorithms are developed for each satellite, those algorithms goes through the revisions uh, multiple time uh, during the lifetime of the mission. So uh, when satellite is launched, there's a pre-launch algorithm ready to be used when the, once the satellite starts sending the data. And as we start learning more about the data, we do the validation, we learn new things about the data. And some of those new learning aspects, some of those science thing, we implement in the algorithms. And once those new things are implemented in the algorithms or corrections are made, the data are reprocessed. So there are different versions of the data available every time you look from the satellite, uh, any of the satellite data products. So currently, you can already see there are three different versions uh, uh, already happened actually in very short period of time from TROP-OMI. 
and currently that 1.03 version is the latest version uh, there are two different uh, strains of uh, processing actually three one is called near real time which is identified as nrti and there's offline and there is another one which is called reprocessing uh, so depending on if you're reprocessing the entire mission then you use those stream the near real time data are available within few hours of the overpass of the satellite and they have been used for real time application like air quality forecasting and other uh, disaster management type of uh, applications so uh, there are several assumptions made in real time uh, algorithms uh, which are corrected when you are reprocessing the data because you always algorithm depends on ancillary set of the data sets uh, to retrieve certain parameters. So we will see a little bit more on that uh, in coming slides. <sighs> Spatial resolution, like we said in the beginning, uh, TROPOMI is about six times higher in terms of the spatial resolution. Here this image just shows the NO2 on the left from the OMI. Again, this is just one day, November 22, 2017. On the right is the same area of the Earth observed by uh, trop omi you can clearly see uh, from left to right the resolution is very high on the trop omi you will also see some gaps in the data in omi and those gaps are coming from uh, there's something called a row anomaly and this is instrument certain uh, sensor uh, rccd cameras on the instrument are not working as expected and therefore those data has been masked uh, to make sure we are getting uh, accurate NO2 measurements. So that is why you see some of the data gaps in OMI, but in TROP OMI, uh, you don't see those gaps. The instrument is working fine and uh, providing very high quality, high resolution uh, NO2 data. And throughout this presentation, uh, we have tried to provide uh, various links of source of these images and uh, additional where you can find the additional information about uh, these data products okay so excuse me just give me a let me drink some water so those who are interested in uh, algorithm uh, how the no2 is retrieved uh, from those spectral measurement by tropomi one of the strongest suggestion i will give you is to go through that atbt which we talked earlier algorithm theoretical theoretical basic document the link is also given in the bottom of this slide you can look at that but you should also uh, just to give you a very big picture overview of how this algorithm works is you have this spectral radiance measurement from the tropomi which we just talked and looked and then there's an algorithm called dos differential optical absorption spectroscopy uh, this is a radio transfer based algorithm which accounts uh, for different absorption spectra in the atmosphere specifically for no2 and this algorithm you provide the spectral radiance to this uh, algorithm which operates in the wavelength range of 405 to 460 nanometer uh, specifically for no2 retrievals if you want to learn more about the dos again you can find a lot of information in atbt but also there are some references uh, about earlier work on this algorithm which are given here uh, the output from the dos algorithm comes the no2 slant column density and there is a data assimilation system which provides information on the vertical distribution of these NO2. So when you combine this slant column density with the data assimilation system, you get two pieces of information, tropospheric NO2 slant column density and the uh, stratospheric NO2 slant column density. So you have two pieces of information for stratosphere and for troposphere. Now, since for air quality, we are mostly interested in tropospheric column uh, NO2. This is further uh, corrected for air mass fraction to convert into the vertical column density. And the air mass factors are basically a uh, function of uh, surface albedo, terrain height, uh, satellite geometry, uh, 
in the cloud fractions. And those are derived, uh, used in form of lookup tables. Uh, this data simulation system is nothing but a TM5 MP model, which uh, data are available of it about one degree by one degree resolution and has been combined with that retrieve value. So this is in very over uh, big picture view of how the algorithms run. So there are three different pieces of the algorithms and all the details about this, all those pieces can be found in this algorithm theoretical basis document. The product, NO2 product and the file name. So when we start downloading and playing with the data, you will see the file name is very long. It's about 86 characters uh, uh, in the length. And uh, <clears throat> the table actually gives you specific, uh, the character number zero to uh, 86 and what those mean. So I'm going to focus mostly on the one which are important. So from zero to three, which is S5P is nothing but mission name. And it says always it will be S5P for, uh, for tropomy data. That's a Sentinel 5P precursor. NRTI, we talked about the near real time versus offline. So the NRTI is basically the same near real time data. If it is offline, it will say offline OFL. If it is reprocessing, it will say RPRO reprocessing. So depending on which stream of the algorithm it is going through, uh, this will change. Then you from nine to nine, the product identifiers, and these are listed in the earlier table which we saw about the product. So in this case, this is level two and or two. Then you have the, the data are provided actually for each orbit. And one orbit of uh, tropomy contain the data for about 100 minutes, 100 and 100 one minute about and in this specific case this is the start time which is highlighted in blue color and uh, in the format of year four digit year two digit month two digit day and then the t is common uh, which is start for which stand for the time and then you have 18 hours 30 minutes 16 seconds and this is a GMT time or UTC time. So this is not your local time. If you want to convert that into your local time, you have to make the correction for the UTC to your local time. This is start time and this is end time. So this specific granule is for 2018, August 16, uh, 1830 uh, GMT to 2011 GMT, which is about 101 minute to minute time window. And then you have orbit numbers. Some people like to use orbit numbers to identify their granules. Uh, and then there are some other processing information which you may not be using, but that's there for you to um, use if it makes sense for certain application. Uh, each data product uh, comes with uh, quality uh, assurance or QA filtering. So there are QA values. Uh, for NO2, there are two different uh, suggested Q values. 0.7, if the Q value is larger than 0.75, uh, this is recommended filter. Uh, so when you start using the data for quantitative purpose, make sure you read the Q parameter in the SDS and we'll go through that. I'll show you how to get that and make sure you use filter your data for those uh, recommended uh, values of QA. So the, when you use the 0.75 uh, larger than that value, it means it removed cloud scenes. And when you are using the Q value larger than 0.5, it means the, you are getting good quality data over cloud scene and snow and ice as well. So there's a possibility of cloud contamination when you reduce the Q value. So just keep, keep an eye on that when you start this data. Uh, this may not be that relevant when we are just making the images for visual purposes, but when you start doing quantitative analysis, uh, making calculations, then this QA value becomes really, really important. Okay, another two document which we already, I think, kind of gone through, uh, but very, very important. If you plan to use tropomy data, uh, these are your go-to guide actually. So. ATBT, we already talked on the left side, and then the user manual uh, for NO2, which is on the right. Again, the links are given here, and these are, like I said, these are your go-to document for any of the 
further information on the energy product from the drop home. Validation is an important aspect of uh, any satellite retrievals uh, algorithm. Uh, it's integrated part of data analysis. Uh, in terms of NO2, uh, we talked a little bit about that in OMI presentation. And similarly to OMI, uh, NO2 product from TROPOMI are validated using the ground measurements, uh, which comes from Pen either Pandora network or the MaxDOS networks. And the expected uh, errors in NO2, uh, for stratospheric NO2, it's about less than 10%, and for tropospheric NO2, it's about 25 to 50%, so it can be large. So remember, most of the NO2 are in uh, tropospheres near the source because of the short lifetime, and since uh, the vert information on the vertical distribution of NO2 is coming from the model, there are high uh, probability of uh, larger uh, biases in tropospheric column uh, near the source. This is a validation website uh, for TROP OMI where they do routinely validation of each of the product and provides the reports here. I'm going to just very quickly show this uh, so that you I'm going to click this website and then it will take me to let me see if I can show you the Chrome Okay, I hope you are able to see my uh, web page. So this is a validation facility and you can click on any of this product. So in case of nitrogen dioxide, once I click nitrogen dioxide, I reach to this page and here you can see quarterly validation report, then first validation results. And there are like weekly also, I think there are reports available here. Once you click on the first validation results, there is a diagram which shows scatter plot between max docs observed NO2 in molecules per centimeter square versus the trop OMI, and the correlation is about 0.6. Uh, so you can see some bias, consistent bias, uh, uh, low bias uh, in OMI, uh, in trop OMI data in this specific validation. If you click on the download PDF file here, this symbol then you will reach to a document which can give you more details on those validations, more insight where those locations are, uh, of the DOS instruments are located on the earth and some more details. And this, I think they do revise this uh, quickly uh, and very often to provide up-to-date validation results. And this is again important aspect if you plan to use the data uh, make sure you refer to the validation and make sure you account for those uh, potential bias in the data sets, specifically when you are making quantitative uh, calculations. Okay, moving forward, data user guide. This is another resource for you to find all the details about the data products, what are the specific scientific data sets inside that, and uh, you will find a lot of useful information here as well. Okay, since I have left only 10 minutes, I'm going to go quickly to exercise to a panoply. I hope uh, as part of instruction we have given for this webinar series, uh, I, we requested you to download the panoply on your computer. So if you have panoply already installed on your computer, uh, uh, we are going to go through this exercise uh, and see some of the data file which we downloaded. Okay, so how to get the data first? Uh, we have gone through that exercise in part one through NASA Earth data. The link is given here. It required registration. There is another, uh, another source of getting data from Copernicus Open Access Hub. It's called Sentinel Hub. It also required uh, registration. We have provided these links in the uh, uh, on our training page. They are given also here. Uh, feel free to register. And both data sets, uh, either they are coming from the NASA Earth or ESA, they are the same product. So uh, there's no there's no difference uh, whether you download the data from the NASA or ESA. Uh, you should get the same file. Make sure. Uh, they are same coming from the same streaming or processing as we saw uh, 
near real time versus offline versus reprocessing. Okay, this is the how the Sentinel Hub uh, data center work. We already looked actually the NASA Earth part, and since we already looked, I'm not going to go over the Sentinel Hub, but this link will take you to there. Uh, again, if you are registered, they will allow you to search the data and we'll be able to download the data. So with that, I'm going to move to the Panoply. Panoply is an open source uh, software which runs offline on your computer. It has uh, Windows and Mac both version. Today we are going to use the Mac version. To sh I will show you on from my screen. If you have already installed the software on your computer, feel free to follow. Uh, those who are on the window, uh, most of the stuff should be same. If there are differences, I will point them out. If you do not have, go to this link and download. It's very quickly. It should not take more than five minutes to download and install the software. So with that, let me go through one. Uh, just before actually I go through the exercise, I just want to show you slides so that you, those who have not downloaded the data, next four slides shows the link to get those data. So this is aerosol index. If you click on the link at the top, you should be able to download the data. Make sure these links are from the NASA Earth data. So it may ask you to log in. So if you have not registered, it may not be allowed to download the data. So make sure you register and uh, log logged in to get the, this data. This is methane data. Uh, this is carbon monoxide. Uh, and again, we are looking the August 2018 case just to see some of the images from those fires. This is nitrogen dioxide, and then we'll talk about next week's preparing. So now I'm giving everyone about one minute to prepare for this exercise, and then I will start showing uh, panoply exercise uh, here in a minute. Uh, Okay, I think let's let's do a couple of polls before actually we move to the panoply. I think we have some time. So I'm going to drop some polls here. Uh, and polls are basically quiz as you are done in the part one similarly. So just to uh, make sure that everybody is listening to me. Okay, so the first poll is Can you see it? You have about 30 seconds to respond to this. So here you can see 80% people responded correctly. It's a European Space Agency mission, ESA mission. It's not NASA mission and it's not ISRO mission, definitely. So just, uh, just to make sure that you understand that part. Okay. The, the next question is, so the next question is tropomy's spatial resolution is approximately times higher than omi how many times higher than omi we talked about that a little bit uh, again you get about 50 seconds to complete this so i got 57 people 57 percent people voted for this poll and the correct answer is about six times. So 72% people got it right. Uh, it's not definitely 100 times higher. We are not there yet. So uh, this correct answer is 6%. Okay, since we are running out of the time, I'm to going to go back and show you very quickly some of the panoply exercise. Uh, okay, now you should be able to see uh, my screen. And I'm going to come out of the PowerPoint mode and then show you the panoply. So the panoply icon looks like this. If you can see, it's a globe with the blue and red shade. And once you start it, you will see, let me start from the beginning. You will see a window like this. Or uh, if you are on Mac and window, the appearance might look a little bit different. Uh, but on the top, you will see 
a panel where there's a file in the file you can click on open once you click the open you should see the directory structure now you can select where you have kept your the data so remember those four files which we asked you to download you need to have those files in order to see this so since we are actually kind of running out of time i'm going to extend this about five seven more minutes so that uh, we can go through this exercise uh, so those who can stay longer please stay so i have already selected my uh, directory in which the data are kept and since the software already identified which file it can read you can see there are four files in my directory which it, which ends with dot nc and there are no2 co ch4 and aerosol so i'm going to go one by one and open this file so first let's start with the aerosol file it says ar ai once i open it shows there are two different separate part of this panoply panel one on the left shows the list of the product or the sdas what we call scientific data sets on the right it shows all the metadata about those uh, specific product so for example if you click there are various subgroups of the data in this specific .net cdf files uh, the product which we are interested in are under the tab called product or the subgroup called product if you click the product you will see aerosol index 340 380 uh, aerosol index precision the aerosol index 354 to 388 again the aerosol index 340 to 380 if you click on that on the right side panel you will start seeing details or the uh, attributes for that product so it shows what is their unit uh, what is their dimension so it has a time dimension of one versus the scan line is 30 to 45 with the ground pixel of 450 uh, the long name the wavelength range uh, coordinates and longitude range coordinates and the fill values it does not have any scaling values or anything i click that and i'm going to actually plot the one which is corresponding to the omi wavelength which is 354 to 388 and then on top left there is a button called create plots i click that it will show me a panel with three different options it says create a georeferenced 2d plot and then the horizontal and ground pixel axis so i'm going to create i want to create a map so I will say create a georeferenced plot and click on the create and it should show a map like this. A new window should appear where you will see a map of tropomy. So this is one orbit of tropomy on August 16, 2018 passed over United States in part of the South America. The aerosol index range by default it takes the minimum and maximum values you can change that so you can go to the scale window on the uh, left of this drop on it, uh, on the panoply window and you can change it to make it visualization a little bit better so i'm going to start this with minus one two six just to see some features better so now i can see actually very high values a lot more contrast in this picture and now if you want to zoom in certain part of this you can actually click command button on your mac and start will show you a plus sign and you can click any part of the image and it will zoom if you do not have uh, if you're on the linux machine on the window machine you can actually go to plot on the top panel and there is a zoom plot in and zoom plot out you can do that click on that and that will also zoom in and zoom out actually so this is zoom in and then zoom out 
And then you can see very nicely aerosol plumes coming from those fires. Okay, now let's move to the next data product. Uh, I'm going to very quickly show to other uh, open NO2 file, open NO2 file. And again, in NO2, you can see the similar data structure. Uh, under the product, we have all the different parameter which we need. So one of the thing which we are interested is nitrogen dioxide tropospheric column. That is what we are going to use for air quality application. And you can also see for the SDS, there is a QA value, which we looked earlier. Uh, remember in the slide. And then there are other information as well here. So I'm going to plot the nitrogen dioxide tropospheric column. Again, create plot. I'm going a little bit quickly here because I don't have really time. Uh, again, the scale is, the values are very small in this case. So you have to adjust the scale uh, in order to, to see the features. So you, you have to adjust this scale to make sure that your uh, values are uh, like. But if you go back to the PPT I was showing you, uh, if you make some adjustment, you will be able to do this kind of scaling and start seeing some of the NO2 hotspots. Uh, similarly, you can look uh, other data products like methane or carbon monoxide, which is given in those files. Since we are a little bit behind in this, uh, this part, I'm not going to go through all the files, but this is very, very easy to use tool. It gives you a very good insight on those net CDF file. And then you can make quickly plots. Uh, once your plot is ready, you can go to the file. You can export that a save image as, and you can save them as a PNG image or something else you like to do. You can also extract the data into CSV format. So export the data, right? So if you click on this specific parameters and then export data, export as CSVA, and then you will be able to export that entire data into CSV file, which can be opened in any text editor or Excel file. We will go through this a little bit more actually on Monday uh, when we use the Python uh, scripts to read similar files. So we will read these same files, uh, mostly for NO2, and go a little bit more into depth uh, when we do the Python scripts. With that, uh, I'm almost done. I just want to show quickly uh, another slide before it's kind of homework for uh, Monday before Monday session. So uh, we have posted instruction to install Python uh, and there will be code, testing code will be posted on our said website. Please make sure you uh, download and install and make sure your Python is working. And we are going to use Anaconda to run the Python script. Uh, the data are also, uh, instructions are available on in the slides also as well as on the RZ web page. Uh, so please make sure you have the data in Python ready for Monday session, which will be two hour long session where we will read and uh, extract uh, different types of information from the data sets, both for TROPOMI and OMI. So with that, I will end. Uh, sorry for a little bit late, uh, but we should be ready to take question answer in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, everyone, uh, I think we are ready to take question answers. Uh, you should see the screen uh, with a Google document showing question and answer for session two. Uh, we have taken questions uh, you posted in the question section of the GoToWebinar and pasted here, and we will try to go over one by one. Uh, and my colleague, uh, uh, Elizabeth, she is going to type the response here um, and we will share this transcript uh, once we review and uh, clean it up. Uh, we will post this on the training page for you to further refer uh, the, those responses. 
So with that, I'm going to start taking the first question. So what general pre-processing and calibration need to be performed while analyzing trop omi data? Okay, so the short answer, if you are using level two data, uh, like the one which we showed today, like NO2 aerosol index or any of those things, then most you should be aware of the calibration, uh, but you do not need to make any correction yourself. Uh, you should be aware of the errors which can occur due to those calibrations changes, but you do not have to make those changes. Those changes are already performed in level one data which are used to create level two data. So uh, if you are doing your own retrieval algorithms, then you may have to perform those calibrations uh, depending on which version of the data you are using. Can we transform the uh, transform the net CDF format tropomy data into more similar tabular format like CSV? If we can, do we lose any information by doing that? Yes, you can do that. And that's exactly we are going to do uh, on Monday using Python script. Uh, you can also do actually using the panoply, which I just showed, uh, and you do not lose any information. Question three, are you aware and can cite example of OMI and TROPOMI data product application in air quality managed by management by national and regional public organization. So OMI data has been uh, used uh, for a long time in various, uh, uh, by various agencies, uh, specifically to look for trends in NO2 and SO2. Uh, US EPA has specifically used uh, OMI NO2 uh, trend to confirm their ground measurements trends over United States. Uh, there are uh, many other application people have shown, uh, for example, gas uh, and oil and gas activities uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, Melanie has shown some of those examples. Uh, Tropomy data are injected actually into Copernicus uh, uh, Global Air Quality Monitoring Program. Uh, they have been assimilated into those models. Uh, but I am not uh, sure if Tropomy data has been already started by any of those uh, air quality management agencies yet. Uh, OMI data has been used um, uh, in several cases, uh, but it really depends on uh, the scale is very different uh, for different agencies. Okay, question number four. Any timeline on GEMS and TEMPO launch date for NASA is aside? Okay, so GEMS is a Korean satellite. Uh, it will be launched in 2020 or 2020, 2020, 2021, I would say. Uh, Tempo is a NASA mission. It will be launched in late 21 to 22. Question five. Can we retrieve an approximate value of NO2 concentration for a specific let long from tropomy product, uh, is it just visualization? Yes, you can get a specific value of NO2 on a specific location, and we will show you how to do that using Python script on Monday. Question number six, does the data from tropomy can be used to do the air quality modeling for a small scale area? The short answer is yes. Uh, it will really depend on what small area you're talking about. 
and what kind of air quality modeling you want to do. But tropomic data can be uh, used to intercompare uh, model outputs. It can also be used to assimilate the data into model. Uh, it can also uh, do a number of other things uh, for air quality modeling. Question number seven, can we you access the data through API? Yes. The short answer is yes. Uh, I do not have the exact link at this point, but if you go on the Trop Omi website, which I showed earlier, there is a section called data and tool and under which you should find ways to get the data through API. But I'm sure they have API access to the Trop Omi data. If there are restrictions to be made on the TROPOM instrument when it is on the routine runtime environment, how are these corrections made in the instrument of the TROPOM? Uh, I am not sure if I understand the question correctly, but uh, there are instances when uh, instrument Usually instrument runs continuously. There is no uh, uh, unusual switch on and off of the instrument uh, or maintenance, uh, but sometime uh, satellite orbit has to be manually maneuvered to avoid certain uh, space debris uh, and during those time uh, the data can be affected, but otherwise uh, it's uh, continuous uh, instruments are running continuously. Question number nine, tropomy data provided in the tropomy.eu and are the same? Yes, they are the same. For analytics, Panoply does not help much. Is there any other tools such as ArcGIS Pro can be used? If you can open NetCDF file in ArcGIS, then you can use it uh, and we will show some Python tools uh, Monday to analyze uh, some of the uh, some of the tropomic data. Question 11, does Sentinel O3 product cover whole the globe? Yes, if you are talking about tropomic ozone product, then yes, uh, it does cover whole globe. On slide 16, can you explain why CH4 looks high concentration in Cambodia? Uh, I'm not sure why it is high in Cambodia, but uh, let's see. Let me see if I can see slide 16. Uh, I'm not sure why it is high, but the, you have to look into the sources of CH4. Uh, usually methane is emitted by fossil fuel burning and uh, by, uh, some of those, uh, what, what do you call them, some, like uh, in areas where they have a lot of uh, animal farms and things like that, uh, you can see high concentration of CH4. Uh, but you have to look a specifically source in Cambodia in order to uh, uh, in order to identify why the high values are showing in Cambodia. I'm not familiar with that region. Question 13. NRTI versus offline data is stream. What is the different explain in their application? Okay, so NRT is near real time. Uh, they are produced uh, within within one to two hour of the overpass of satellite. So if suppose uh, Tropomi is overpassing over Europe at 10.30, the data should be available in next one to two hour over the Europe. And since, uh, as you saw on the algorithm web uh, slide, there are additional information required to retrieve uh, certain parameter 
and those additional parameters may not be available in real time. So we need to make some assumption about those parameters. So in the, the way near real time algorithms are designed, they're fast to work faster and produce the data. Uh, offline algorithms are much more robust. Uh, they have all the necessary supporting data sets and model required to produce more accurate uh, and more realistic value of a specific product. Uh, and they are usually delayed by several days uh, depending on the specific data products. Near real-time data are specifically used for application which require near real-time data. For example, air quality forecasting, uh, natural hazard mapping, uh, like during the volcanic eruption where things are moving, like uh, during the wildfires, like how the aerosols are moving. For those, you need real-time data. Accuracy becomes secondary in those cases. Uh, for more quantitative analysis, scientific analysis, uh, like long-term trend or quantifying impact of certain things on, uh, and quantifying impact of fires on aerosol loading or quantifying uh, impact or emissions from certain power plants, you need more accurate data sets, uh, best data sets. And for that, usually we use the offline processing or reprocessing streams. Question 14, why are negative aerosol index? So aerosol index is a quantity calculated for every single measurement, uh, irrespective of cloud or no cloud. So usually when you have absorbing type of aerosols, the value is positive. When you have scattering type of aerosols like sulfate aerosol or cloud, then the values are usually negative. So most, most often which when you see negative value of, of aerosols, they are uh, usually cloud or, uh, or in urban areas, you will see if there is dominating type of scattering particles. Question 15, in your opinion, did the calibration performed for OMI for, for the NO2 data have enough validation to be applied in South America without additional modeling? Again, uh, I think uh, current calibrations and the data quality is good, but I'm not specifically sure about the performance in South America. I would strongly suggest you go to their validation website, uh, look even for some of the papers they might have published or contact some of the people uh, and you will be able to find a little bit more uh, uh, better answer in that way. If you still don't find, feel free to email me and I will try to find a specific paper for you uh, and we'll try to uh, put you in touch with people who make those validation. How to separate the tropospheric NO2 from stratospheric NO2 do the bright surface reflectance affect NO2? Okay, so let me take the second part of the question first. Yes, the bright surface reflectance does affect NO2 retrieval and therefore the modeling uh, or the characterization of uh, surface reflectance uh, become important and we and the algorithm te team currently use the OMI based uh, reflectivity, surface reflectivity, uh, but in future uh, once more data are accumulated from TROP OMI, they will start using the TROP OMI based uh, reflectivity. Uh, now the part one of the question, uh, the separation of columnar uh, value of NO2 are separated into stratospheric and tropospheric uh, part using a global model. It's a chemical transport model uh, which runs at about one degree by one degree and the vertical profiles of NO2 is obtained from that and based on that the scaling is done uh, and converted into two different uh, piece of information. So uh, if you look the algorithm slide, there is a data simulation system block on that and that's where the vertical information comes from. Question 17, can you 
explain the difference between real time offline and reprocessing version of the data again okay i did just explain and i think the answer is there uh, so you can just check the previous answer how to calculate aerosol height okay so aerosols height are actually uh, in case of tropomy, the algorithm uh, will use the band in 700 nanometer uh, uh, range of solar spectrum. And the way it has been done is they choose a specific absorption line uh, in those spectral range uh, to calculate the height at different altitude, depending on the sensitivity of a, spe a specific uh, wavelength to a specific component of the atmosphere. Uh, they try to figure out where the aerosols uh, layer height is. Um, again, I'm not really uh, uh, sure about the specific uh, details of the algorithm, but if you are interested, uh, please write to me an email and I can provide the activity, or you can just go to the Tropomi website and click on that aerosol height product page and you should be able to find the ATVT document there, which will have all the details uh, about the algorithm. Could you give a significance on UV AER 38 index and how we can use it to calculate measures such as PM 2.5 concentration? So, uh, in general, UV aerosol index are not used to calculate PM 10 concentration. UV aerosol index demonstrate the amount of absorbing aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, the, their value also depend on the height of the aerosol layer in the atmosphere. Uh, typically, these measurements are sensitive for uh, high altitude aerosols, uh, so they are not recommended to use to calculate PM10 or PM2.5. Question 20, how are the QA values are created? QA values are created based on certain decision uh, which are made throughout the processing of the data. So when you start with level 1B data radiance and go through the algorithm, in the algorithm there are several steps like cloud clearing, uh, snow ice masking, surface reflectance value calculation, lookup table, air mass factors, all those factors contribute in calculating the QA values. There is a, no one single mathematical formula, but there are many different pieces uh, of uh, algorithm in which errors can produce. Uh, uh, so basically QA shows how your algorithm has performed. So it's indicator of the performance of the algorithm and uh, the value is decided based on the various factors which uh, are accounted in the algorithm. Uh, in case of TROP OMI, uh, I don't know those specific uh, factors, but again, uh, ATVT is your document uh, to look for those specific details. Can we analyze the data in R? Uh, again, I'm not sure, but if you can open the NetCDF file, yes, sure. Question 22, any gaseous mercury data is there? Uh, again, I'm not familiar with any such data. What are the cloud screening criteria for CO and NO2? So, the cloud screening uh, is done using a standard method and also they sometimes they are also going to use uh, cloud from the VRS data. Uh, again, if you want to go into the specific details, uh, you can find those into ATVT document. I'm not familiar with the um, very details of cloud screening for your NFT product. Question 24, is it possible to subset the resultant model image to smallest shape file? Uh, 
we are not i don't think i understand the question but uh, if you are asking if you can convert the net cdf into shape file the short answer is yes there are various ways in python uh, which can do that uh, i'm not expert on that so i will not comment further Question 25, I think I just responded to that and uh, how to use just for NO2, there is a slide in PPT where we specifically talk about the QA value uh, which are recommended by the science team of top form of me, which you can use. Question 26, 2006 AOD plot. I wonder if you happen to know the general wind direction and can point out the wildfire location. Seems fires should be at location of most intense AOD and then decrease with distance from the fire is the correct assumption. Uh, first of all, those plots were not of aerosol optical depth, but aerosol index from the tropomy and there's a significant difference between the two products. Second, uh, I'm not sure about the wind direction at this point, but uh, there are ways in which you can look the wind direction. Uh, and the assumption is correct. You should see high values close to the source and away from the uh, source. But at the same time, depending on the time of the observation, you might see less amount of smoke near the source and high amount of smoke which has been transported to the long distance. So you may not see your assumption can become invalid in those conditions. So it depends on at what level the fires were and when the satellite were making measurement. Remember, this is only one time measurement from this satellite. <clears throat> Question 27, which spectral data we are supposed to take for aerosol? So for aerosol index, uh, uh, there are two sets of wavelength they are using right now, 380 and 3, uh, uh, sorry, 3, 354 and 380, which is corresponding to uh, OMI wave, uh, uh, Tom's wavelength, and there is another one, which is 354, 354 to 388, which is corresponding to OMI wavelength. So there are two aerosol index which are provided, 340 to 380 and then 354 to 388. Question 28, how to extract net CDF data with latitude and longitude? Uh, we will go through that exercise uh, on Monday. Question 29, when it is useful to use TROMI data rather than TROMI data? If you are looking for uh, higher resolution data, uh, then the TROMI data should be used. Can we retrieve emission data instead of column concentration? Uh, so there are methods uh, which can be used to convert those uh, column data into emission data sets uh, but those data sets are not available on operational basis uh, but individual groups of people have developed methods in which uh, column data can be converted into emissions What percentage of error is happened due to cloud while processing NO2? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you will have to refer that to the ATVT document for that. Uh, question 32, how much is the correlation between satellite derived product and ground based observation data? So one of the validation which we just looked in this exercise says correlation of 0.76, but that was first validation exercise. So I won't go on that number, but you can again uh, check their validation website and make sure uh, they have, make sure you're using the 
up-to-date validation numbers uh, and that will give you a little bit more into details about how the uh, performance as compared to the governance models. Question 33, how large settlements can be monitored with tropomic data? Again, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. But if you are asking, it really depends on how big the source is. Um, the tropomy is very sensitive because of its uh, high signal to noise ratio and high spatial resolution. So you should be able to see even smaller sources. Uh, but really, it's a very subjective question. So uh, I don't know what exactly, how small you can go in terms of the source. Is there homework for this session? Yes, the homework is make sure you install the Python properly, make sure all the data sets are ready, and make sure all the packages of the Python which are required for this exercise for Monday uh, works in on your computer. We will go through each exercise on Monday. And I want to make, make sure that everyone, everyone who is online on Monday should be able to actually go through those exercises. Okay, question 35. How many molecules per centimeter only? What is the calibration correlation in PVA1? Uh, I'm sorry, but this is, I don't understand this question at all. Question 36. Can we transform abundance or density of NO2 molecules into concentration? I think so. Uh, there are ways in which you can con uh, convert things into different units. Um, I don't remember my top of my head how to convert the molecules uh, into PPM or PPV. Question 37, we'll be able to look at 7 by over NYC for an isolated power plant on the south shore of Long Island. Yes, uh, on Monday when we do the Python exercise, um, you should be able to extract the data at any location you like. Looks like Pandora and Meg's DOS calibration uses ground-based air column spectroscopy. Are there any other ground-based air quality monitoring data such as air now? So the Pandora and Meg's DOS kind of make measurement of the same quantity, which comes from the satellite retrieval also. Uh, on the other hand, uh, air quality agencies like air now network makes uh, surface level concentration. So those are uh, little bit different quantities. So there is uh, some conversion required when we start comparing satellite data with the ground measurements such as air now network. Question 39, can we get PM 2.5 and PM 10 from tropomy? Short answer is there is no such data product, but but you can probably use aerosol optical depth along with some other parameter to get PM 2.5 and PM 10 um, uh, with some uh, uncertainties. But they, there is no standard product and I don't think there's any plan to produce any standard PM 2.5 or PM 10 product from Tropom. When converting to image, question number 40, when converting to image in Panoply, for example, dot JPG, the result is a georeferenced image raster. Yes, the image is georeferenced. You will see basically exactly the same map as you see on the screen. Can you convert tropomy data into TIFF format? Yes, you can convert that. Uh, you can do that using uh, panoply or you can also do that using any of the GIS 
uh, software which can handle NetCD data. Okay, I think it is 9.40 now and I see uh, the questions 41 we responded. If you have further question, we can take more. Actually, we'll have a little bit more time on Monday, uh, longer time. Again, please make sure for Monday uh, you have working Python and the data are downloaded. So with that, I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for attending and uh, I will see you everyone back on Monday. Thanks. Bye-bye.